Welcome to Solutions with Courtney Anderson. I am Courtney Anderson. I appreciate you taking time out of your life to be part of the program today. And as always, I invite you to come to CourtneyAnderson.com and look at all of the different uh, programs that we have available reach out, share your opinions, feedback, show ideas, anything that's on your mind. So today we have a program that is part of the Educators Eden series. And of course, Educators Eden is all about uh, those wonderful people who volunteer to be educators, people who love information and knowledge and sharing knowledge. And it's about how they use tools, techniques, and frameworks to ensure not only are they surpassing their goals or doing everything in their power to set the circumstances to allow their students to pursue and eventually, potentially, surpass their goals. And they literally have created paradise on earth. It's Eden for these educators because they, they have this wonderful opportunity to do that cliche, right? They They are following their passion, they love information, they love ideas, and here they are every day getting to do just that, their favorite thing. And so we talk about, share, support, admire, uh, and appreciate those educators. And for those who aspire to be educators and in their own individual educators, Eden, we want to show how do you do it, how do you sustain it, how do you stay there? So our specific show today, our episode is How to Handle Grade Disputes, also known as I Never Got in Fill in the Blank Grade Before. And this is a really, I'm just going to say it, it's a fun show for me. Uh, one of the things when we, we talk about uh, education, again, we always want to make sure that and it's it's easy. We already know this. People in educators even already know this. I mean, if you don't have a passion for ideas, information, knowledge, and you don't enjoy sharing knowledge, then of course you wouldn't want to be an educator because it wouldn't be fun for you. It wouldn't be the thing that made you happy. It's just like if you're somebody who loves wrestling. You know, if wrestling makes you happy, you were you you've always done your you've always engaged in wrestling, you've been on the wrestling team, you watch wrestling in your free time, you love wrestling, then you should do something in wrestling. If you're somebody who has no interest in wrestling, you never, you know, have even, you know, done wrestling, you don't care about wrestling, don't go into a, a profession where you're in the wrestling field if you don't have any interest in it. It's not gonna be joyful for you. And of course, one of our fundamental pr- principles in everything we do is you know, practicing the joyful art of business. So we have to take responsibility to make sure that we are in the right place, right? The right place for us. Do I like this stuff? Assuming that, of course, we do, grade disputes, and when I, like I said, when I work with educators, are something that we don't at all worry about or we're not concerned about. Sometimes when there's someone who might not be in education for the right reasons, meaning it's not really... It's not their place. It's like they're hired by a wrestling, you know, business, and they don't even have an interest in wrestling. They're bored. It's not for them. And the reality, of course, is that all of us have probably a list that we could never complete of things that we are not interested in, right? So I just use wrestling. It could be, you know, Brussels sprouts. Um, maybe you're not interested in, you know, pencils. And you might think, well, who cares about Brussels sprouts and principles? Each of those are businesses, right? There's Brussels sprouts. I just was at the grocery store and market yesterday. Somebody's got to, you know, grow and harvest and market and sell and have quality control over Brussels sprouts. Somebody still makes pencils. They were also at the store. Uh, You know, so you name a thing or an idea. Somebody somewhere did that, created a way to, to have that as part of our society, whether it's in the market or it's something we can and learn about or experience. I mean, so, you know, it might seem silly. Well, who cares about Brussels sprouts and pencils? Well, somebody does. And in fact, I've worked with organizations um, and people who are out dedicating their lives to the, all these different things. That's the beauty of the world. When it works ideally the way it should, we take our talents, which of course mean we have to investigate and find out what those are. And we go to that space in, in the world where we, you know, we little we let our little light shine. We just like it. it it makes us feel good and we and if we can match those 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 
issues, the things that kind of excite us and we're interested in, along with something that we really do for our work, whether it's paid or volunteer, then that's bliss. It's Eden, right? So the great disputes are something that most no, I mean, I mean, I hate absolutes, like, right? you know, never and all, because rarely are they accurate. But someone who's an educator's Eden almost never worries about a great dispute. Because we understand that we're doing our work. We love education because we love education. We would love education for free. Many people who are in educator's Eden have done volunteering, do also engage in volunteer um, educating and teaching and, and co courses and programs, and then also sometimes we'll combine that and, and do um, paid. Sometimes you'll have somebody who was an educator that had a, a, a paid profession and then they retired from that and they, they volunteer and they're teaching programs at the youth center or the community center. Um, you never stop if you like information and educating and knowledge. That doesn't turn off if, if you're not in a paid position. So great disputes are something that educators, Eden inhabitants, rarely, if ever, worry about because, again, you're doing the education work because you, it makes you happy. Now, as a great side effect, you also get to work with other people at times who you're part of enriching their journey in life. But educators understand a couple of things. In so many of our programs, we talk about choices and we talk about outcomes and we talk about um, separating our our responsibility from things that are beyond our control. So it's beyond my control, you know, what, what the weather is. It's beyond my control, all types of things. As educators, as any professional, again, whether paid or volunteer, it's my responsibility to make sure that I have my needs met before I enter into my work. My needs are sort of the basics, right? Food, water, shelter, um, hygiene. And then ideally I should, if I'm fortunate enough, in uh, many parts of the world, I have higher level needs or, or desires, right? What is my dream? You know, so if my dream was to you know, be CEO of a Fortune 500 company and I'm an educator at a small school, I might not be satisfied. That's my responsibility then to change. Either reevaluate what my dreams are or I need to go ahead and leave that teaching position and go pursue my, my real dream. Otherwise, I'll always do that friction and I'll begin over time potentially to become resentful and then I potentially might even start to and neglect some of my teaching duties. And this has everything to do with grade disputes. The grade dispute, of course, is what it sounds like. The student, in many parts of the world, this doesn't, it's not logical because students don't typically, in, in many parts of the world, students don't have the ability to dispute the grade. And culturally, in many parts of the world, even if a student does have the ability, in terms of there's an apparatus for them to um, go to some administration um, office and, and they could dispute a grade, it rarely happens because culturally, in many parts of the world, if the educator, if the teacher, if the professor um, said something, and that's that's the rule, and nobody would even consider that you would go and 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 challenge their 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 decision or judgment. So it's a lot of this is cultural. In the United States and in many other parts of the world, the the apparatus uh, does exist for someone who's a, who receives a grade to say, "I dispute this. I don't accept this grade as being accurate or valid." In addition to that, culturally. And this has changed, but culturally, um, currently, there are some parts of the society who absolutely feel they have the right to challenge whatever uh, the teacher uh, professor says. Now, I said this has changed. I've shared in other programs. One of the reasons um, that we do the program is, that, you know, my own personal experience as an educator and how much I enjoy it, but I also have the honor and the privilege. I come from a family of generations of educators. Both my grandmothers were were teachers. Um, they had uh, their uh, pa parents and grandparents, and, and instances were also teachers on my my father's side. My grandparents' parents um, met at a university, and they were educators. Um, there are so many generations of, again in my family of people who have enjoyed and, and used education. Um, as part of living the best life that they could. So, in historical times in the United States, when my when my grandpa grandparents taught, um, and my my uh, great aunt, um, it was unthinkable 
<laughs> you know, there's. I mean, it was possible, I guess, in theory, that someone could dispute a grave. But you know, if, if a child came home from school, my 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 grandmother, my on my father's side, and her sister were both teachers, and and one taught uh, high school in, in English, and the other one taught uh, young kids, like first grade. Um, and culturally, when they were teaching. You know, if the teacher said something or the student came home and had a, you know, a note from the teacher, the cultural and the family response was, what did you do wrong? You know, we're, how, this is embarrassing. You know, we're going to apologize to the teacher and make sure that, you know, that your behavior is appropriate. I mean, it was a different expectation. So nobody typically in those times historically would ever think I'm going to dispute the grade. I mean, it just, it, it. The level of of sort of respect and deference to the educator was very different. Now, in many parts of the of the U.S., it's still like that, but in some parts of the world, things have changed. So, some people have a position and and think, I don't care who you are, and they'll tell you that, <laughs> and um, they will say to you, I disagree. And they may be a parent of a of a first grader. They sometimes, depending on where you are, um, geographically, regionally, culturally, that may be the first grader themselves. Now, I have taught uh, for my career in higher education and in, in, in universities and undergraduate and graduate programs, mostly graduate um, business students. But when I was uh, years ago, I did spend some time as a substitute teacher in um, the public school system in, in all grades, so everything from, from first grade uh, through high school is a substitute teaching where I just go in to, you know, a teacher is out uh, for a day or, or so, and then they hire a substitute who's you know qualified with certain educational and professional um, requirements and trained to come in and, and substitute for that teacher. So I saw a lot that was really insightful to me because I you know ha I'm not that's not my primary professional expertise is in, is in university level and mostly graduate school. So I did experience <laughs> um, culturally there have been changes and there were young people and even though substitutes aren't the actual um, uh, you know, school faculty member, um, some of the things that some of the the students would say and do were, to me, a bit shocking. That culturally things have changed. So people challenge and say whatever they feel like, I guess, they their, their experience or their upbringing has taught them is appropriate. So all that's to say that, yes, the great disputes do exist. Some parts of the world, still, they, you're not really going to see them. Other parts of the world, you might see them all the time. depends on where you are. I was also giving a little bit of historical narrative that that's also a huge shift itself, even in the parts of the world now where people will just challenge everything, and also sometimes in really inappropriate, non-professional language. What's the point? Here's the point. Those of us who are in Educators Eden are went there because we wanted, went, went to Eden because we want to. We enjoy educating by itself, right? We just love knowledge. You know, if we love, you know, the Spanish language, and we teach the Spanish language, it's like one of those things where you, you, you talk to people and they say, I do this for free. I do it anyway. I love this. It's interesting to me. You know, if you love music and you are a music teacher, <laughs> it's sort of like perfect, right? It was your hobby. It's something that makes you happy. You do it anyway for fun, and now you get to pay to do it. It's awesome. So these that's what I said. That's that, that's that blissful place where sort of what your interests are and what makes you happy, you find a way to, to make that the majority of your professional time. It's just great. The challenge, though, in some parts of the modern cultures, um, people are going to not respect necessarily the position of the educator or, and are going to maybe react in ways that they didn't historically. And that's a change for some of us. The, the issue, though, like I said, is if we're in our Educators Eden, we're not worried about a great dispute, and here's why. Because we're here in Educators Eden of our own accord. It doesn't really have anything to do with the outcomes of the students. Now, let me be clear. The educators are going to do everything in their power. So we have so many programs, and I'm continuing to put together more curriculum to do some more in-depth just education, uh, skill development, sharing, you know, knowledge programs. I love teaching. I do. Uh, coincidentally, I teach all the areas <laughs> that I am most interested in, right? What a surprise. I did exactly what we said, right? If you love music, teach music. I actually do love music, and I that's one of the things I thought about when I was younger. Um you know, but I love business, I love law, I love, you know, all the things that I we, we do in these programs. So that's why I teach those things. I am not responsible for the entire outcome of an individual student's choice. And what I mean by that is I am responsible to do everything in my power to exceed expectations for um, the curriculum, 
for the structure, for transparency, for organization, for high-level feedback, for timeliness, for engagement, for support, um, for being a, an ongoing uh, knowledge resource and professional development uh, resource for my uh, students, current and past, and potentially future. So there's a lot that the educator is responsible for. And there are many things when we talk about, and I have programs on where I don't hesitate at all to say the educator, in an example, may, did not at all meet what, be, what would be my expectations or any other expectations. There are people who do not do what they're supposed to. Yet, even the ideal educator who does everything um, that you can imagine, right, you know, to create all of the things I just referred to, the, the, the whole entire educational experience is really the highest level. Um, you're still going to have individuals who are going to make choices. And those choices may be contrary to what the best outcome would be for them academically. At a certain level, the educator can only do so much. The educator is not able to control other people. So they're going to do everything in their power to set up all these um, environments, um, ability, um, measurements, uh, opportunities to succeed, dialogue, they're going to do everything they can, communication. But, you know, at, at, a, it, at a certain point beyond what the, what the educator is able to control, right, the environment, the curriculum, the, the communication, it's up to an individual. And so... Educators who are educators need when I said they don't worry about the great dispute is because they understand I, I can't control what everybody does. I can't control what anybody does, actually. What I can do is set up an environment that's going to be conducive for most people to succeed if they choose to. If they don't choose to, I'm still going to have people who don't succeed, and I'm still going to have people who are unhappy and feel that this has been the worst thing that ever happened to them being in my educational experience. And many of them, if not some of them, well, hopefully not many of them, but I don't know, it depends. You know, we'll come and, and, and dispute the grade and dispute all kind of things, right? We have a sphere, right? Imagine yourself and there's sort of a circle around you and there's a lot of things that, in that circle that you that are under your management. And again, I mentioned them. Curriculum, communication, transparency. There's a lot of things, though, that are way outside that, that sphere that that you can... You can offer up an opportunity for someone to share with you if they need additional assistance or something's happening in their lives um, that may impact their academic performance. But beyond that, an educator who's in Eden understands I can't take on emotionally or psychologically everybody who's an individual's choices, especially the ones that have bad outcomes. You typically see the great dispute with someone who has poor poor outcomes, right? So they didn't earn the top grades. They didn't earn maybe even average grades. Maybe they failed the class. And usually there are going to be some sort of negative consequence. Maybe they maybe they would not be able to continue on in the program. Maybe they would um, have to repeat, you know, a course or a grade or who knows. But that's usually what triggers the grade dispute, right? You don't usually have the student who earned, you know, a top grade or the second top grade dispute the grade. <laughs> you don't. Um, they may be unhappy and say, well, I should have earned, you know, a higher grade. But you usually don't have them dispute and say take away, you know, the, quote, good grade. Um, so what's going on here? The first thing we need to remember how to handle great disputes is um, let's think about when you were a student. All of us were students. So everybody who's an educator had to be a student at some point. Otherwise, you wouldn't have been able to qualify as an educator. When you were a student, what type of um, grading did you like? Just think about it. Now, one of the things that really frustrated me as a student was when I felt the educator did not give me sufficient grading feedback. I was angry is the right word, when I would go, let's say I wrote a research paper, and I wrote a 25-page research paper, and I put a lot of time and work into this, and I'm excited, finally someone's going to see my masterpiece that I've worked on, right, and I, you know, it's a 25-page research paper, you know, it's APA formatted, so this is, you know, university level, and what do I get back for my grade? I get back, you know, six weeks later, one little sentence, good job, 100%, really? And what I mean by that really is I put, you know, 35 hours into this, and it looks to me like the greater the educator put 12 seconds. And I don't even believe they read it. 
I don't have any evidence they read it because there's no reference to anything within the paper. <laughs> um, what I'm trying to say is this. This wouldn't apply to educators who are already in Educators Eden, but we have other shows and programs I've done about about grading feedback. The first part of how to handle grade dispute is to do everything in your power to prevent them. One, you're going to have grade disputes if you're not in an education position for the right reason. So if you really aren't happy or, or excited, if if you're one of those people who you know says, oh, every day when I wake up and I think I have to go and see those students, I just hate it. I just want to turn around and go back to my my house and go to sleep. I hate those students. All they do is complain, blah, blah, blah. You're not in the right place. You're a wonderful person. You're going to be skilled somewhere else. This isn't the right thing for you. Um, and that often can, that type of attitude and orientation to the to the work where you're not enthusiastic and passionate and excited and fired up personally can result in situations where other parts of the education framework that are your responsibility and under your, your purview um, suffer. So curriculum, communication, um, engagement, and potentially feedback. So when I see an educator who writes good job in 100%, it makes me angry because I feel like they didn't do their job. What is their job? I feel like their job is to do a lot on the on the on the sort of proactive side, create curriculum and, and structure, organization, communication, and engage me. Teach. Tell me something. Right? I, now this is not part of this show, but one of the things that really frustrates me is when someone's in an educator's position, but they don't want to educate. You just want to tell me to, you know, watch a film. When I was younger, you know, before we had the, the Internet like we do, when I was in, you know, high school or middle school, or elementary school, I always got angry at those teachers who you would, I'd go to their class and all we did was watch movies because I felt like you're not teaching. You know, you know, we come in, you sit us down, you turn a film on, you run it for, you know, the whole class period, and then when it's over, you know, the class is over and we leave. You didn't do anything. Now, I mean, you, you turn the movie on, and I don't want to sound disparaging, but there are people who did that habitually. In my mind, I felt like that was just a way for them not to really engage us. I w the educator, I want to know what, what you think. Tell us about this. If it's health class or music class or, you know, history class or world cultures or, you know, whatever. Teach me. Tell me something. So I didn't like that, what I felt like. And, I, and, I, and again, this was me as a young person, but my position, remember, this is us talking about you were a student. I didn't feel like they were teaching. They weren't telling me anything. They were sharing any knowledge with me. They were just sort of read this book or look at this movie. Um, some of that is supplemental material, fine, but that is all that you do, I think, is a challenge because I don't feel like you're, you personally are bringing anything to the, to the program. When you were a student, what, it, what, would, what would have made you frustrated? It's not going to be the same thing that made me frustrated. Maybe you had other pet peeves, but whatever they are, you need to think about those. And then when you go as an educator who's chosen to be there and, and it makes you happy, then you need to create your grading and your course experience, your classroom experience, sort of based on what you ideally would have liked as a student. That's exactly what I've tried to do. When I sit and I think about something, of course, initially what I'll do is think about it from my perspective as the educator, which is a totally different perspective, right? So maybe as an educator, I, if I taught, you know, uh, elementary school and I showed movies every day, maybe I'd have a reason for that. You know, maybe I'd say, well, the, you know, the curriculum changes and I think that the movie does a better job of explaining it and, you know, it's more immersive and I tend to have more attentiveness and, you know, I might have reasons. My argument would still be solely to use other experts takes away the, the credibility of the educator themselves. I mean, I they need to be sharing their knowledge. That's what makes them uniquely an educator and that's what makes the whole thing sort of exciting and awesome. I remember right now, it just came to me. <laughs> um, I'm remembering like a, a high school teacher as a history teacher. And I don't I don't even think I did well in the in the in the course necessarily for other reasons. Beyond the course content, I just was, you know, having some some stress in my life. But I'm remembering right now and I can see I can see the gentleman's face in my mind, my memory of his face. It was he it was about Civil War history. So the Civil War in the United States in that period, and it was history about that. And I'm remembering right now the enthusiasm and the passion that he had for that. I mean, you could just tell this was somebody that it was, again, that perfect marriage of somebody's personal interests and things that kind of, you know, turn him on intellectually. He just loved it. His face would light up, and when he would talk about this, he just knew so much about it. You know, it's sort of like if you talk to somebody who has a, a hobby that they love. You know, they love Star Trek, and they know everything about Star Trek, and they just can talk about it forever. It was it was that experience. And he was intelligent enough to have made choices so that he could take that love and passion he had for Civil War history and make it a job. 
so that he also could then earn income and, and be able to have professional expertise and experiences. So it was brilliant on his part. But I'm remembering now, just it just came to me in a moment, how excited and engaged he was about it. So my point is that even though that wasn't and isn't to this day my number one most exciting um, subject, if it was, I would teach it myself. It's interesting, but the way his his passion and enthusiasm made us passionate and enthusiastic. Sort of that same feeling of when you're a young person and a friend of yours, you know, says to you, "Oh, I, you know, just heard a new, I just heard a new song by this band. They're great. You have to hear this song." Of course, I'm now going to want to do everything in my power to hear that song because I've I got somebody telling me how great it is, and they're so they're so excited about it. That enthusiasm is what drives people to come into your world as an educator and start to understand some of, not maybe not much, but at least that no matter what this thing is, it has some positive value because look how excited you are. Okay, that orientation has a lot to do to deflect grade disputes. If someone perceives that they had a fair assessment and that they were given attention and time, then you're not going to have as many grade disputes. If you have someone, and I just gave an example a little while ago where I said, and this actually happened recently when I was finishing one of my more recent degrees, um, graduate degrees. When I, I write a 25-page research paper and all I get is a good job and 100% six weeks after it was turned in. I mean, I was, I was enraged. Had I received, in a timely manner, in my mind, maybe a week or two is the most, depending on the, you know, there's two weeks is, I feel, more than enough time. Um, and I had gotten some detailed feedback. One of the things that I'm doing, and this isn't the purpose of this show, but we've got other shows, is I'm using technology to allow me to supplement my feedback. Um, so I record uh, audio notes and attach those to the students' work in the gradebook. So that's a really direct personal way, and, it's, and it gets around somebody feeling like all I'm doing is, is just putting good good job on everybody's paper and 100% in the grade book. Now that would take me like what 20 seconds to copy and paste good job and 100% but I cheated. I didn't do my job. I didn't read all their work. I didn't think about all of their work. And of course the audio notes aren't an audio note and, and me saying good job and then that's audio note. No the audio note I certainly <laughs> I, I chal I'm, I'm challenged to, you know, to keep it short because the software has certain limits and so many times I'll have to you know, add two or three audio notes because I couldn't get it all across in one audio note but it's personal it talks about some strengths it talks about some areas for improvement or some weaknesses um, and then I supplement that with written detailed notes in the grade book uh, and then the, if it's a paper if it's a research paper and then I put notes embedded into the paper um, so that's multiple modalities, and that does a lot to show this. If the student sees a grade and is angry, which happens, what I want them to be able to access is why the grade is what it is. If a student has multiple different streams of information, so they hear my voice, they see my, my notes in, embedded in their paper, um, they see the copious uh, notes of feedback about all the discrete aspects of the of the grading process in the gradebook entry, then it makes it harder for them to feel like I'm cheating because I'm not cheating. I did. I read everything over and over again multiple times to try to make sure I'm doing a, a, the fairest evaluation possible. And if a student is still upset about that, what I do when I send the grading announcements to the class is I teach online. So some of this is customized for that, but the process is the same. It doesn't matter if it's tra classroom or not. The idea is to show the students, one, in your teaching, which comes far before the grading, when you were a student, what made you? What did you like as a, as a teacher? Somebody who showed you what was exciting or was interesting to you. Think about that. It might not have been somebody that you, know, that you personally had some great bond with. It, the teacher I referred to earlier who loved uh, Civil War history, I didn't have any kind of personal relationship with that teacher. Um, but I just remembered now the enthusiasm and excitement they had. So it was it made it infinitely more interesting to me. And it made me appreciate how much work they put into everything that they were talking about. There's a huge amount of difference between just turning on some supplemental resource or or putting, you know, hey, giving somebody, hey, read this on your iPad or, you know, watch this movie, then you, ex you know, it's one thing to have us watch it or read it. Why don't you then talk about it? Why don't you teach us? There's a lot more work into you telling us what you think or why you suggest that or engaging us in either, you know, Socratic uh, questioning or just something to, to show your knowledge. 
So to handle the grade disputes, one, you're going to prevent them by making sure that this is the right job for you and that you're sharing your enthusiasm and passion. And you're going to you're going to do everything in your power to ensure that even if they don't agree with the grade, you know, the result, they're going to understand the process. It's sort of like, you know, when you teach math, really very simplistic math. And you always say to your students, you know, show your work. So don't just quote write down the answer. I need you to show your work. Show me how you got to the answer because that's what I need to see. And it's just like that with grading. They you they need to see your work. Show them the work. Show them how you got to that answer. Now, I'll have students who even with the multiple um, types of feedback will still say, I don't agree with this. And my way to handle that is I, when I send the note to the class saying the grades are posted is to invite them and say, look, look, read everything, listen to everything, look at everything first before you tell me that I never got a, you know, whatever grade before. Before you do that, and I'll, I'll say to them, you know, it's sort of like a police officer, um, you know, pulls you over while you're driving on the freeway and says to you, you know, you were speeding, you were driving faster than the speed limit. And, you know, the speed limit is 65 miles per hour, and you were driving, you know, 85 miles per hour. And you say to the police officer, police officer, I never had a ticket before. I never had a ticket before in my whole life. What is this? This is, I, just, I mean, I, there's not an emergency. I, wasn't speed, I don't have a reason why I was driving, you know, whatever speed, but I've never had a ticket. That's not relevant. I don't. The fact that you've never had the ticket is not relevant. The fact is, the police officer, it was assuming that they're accurate, their, their information is accurate, that you were going 85 miles per hour, then who cares that you never got speed ticket before? You just got one now, right? And and that's sort of it. Um, I, I want students to understand. Here's why, and it's a fair process. But they need to see the work. You need to show your work as an educator. Now, does any of this magically stop people from filing grade disputes? No, people still file them. My argument is you're going to have less people file them. And here's the other great thing about why people and educators eat and don't worry about them. If you've gone through the, the, the immense amount of time and work that it shows to create cur curriculum, supplemental materials, your own individual teaching, and you can do this online, obviously you can do this in the classroom, and you can also you know, fail to do this online or in a classroom. Do the equivalent of, hey, just watch a movie class or look at this link. The more you do that, the harder it is then for you to explain later why you should be in the classroom. Plus, I don't understand how much fun it is for you because you, you're not reading the article again or watching that movie for 50th time. You've already seen it. You know, let's make it exciting for you. Part of what makes Educators Eden so blissful and awesome is the educator is happy. There's nothing more mundane and awful than just some sort of repetitive, regurgitated content. That's not, that's, there's nothing new for the educator in that. What's fun in that? Who would want to do that? What makes me excited to teach, you know, is that I can look in my, you know, every morning when I wake up, I can read my, the newspaper and see, you know, 10 new things that remind me about what I was teaching that I can bring right into class immediately or that I'm going to save it in my note file and bring it into class later. Because there's always something happening with some kind of business or law or, um, you know, personal empowerment issue that I teach. I mean, it's exciting. I love this. Right? So, and it's always fresh. That's what I said. So it's something new that I hadn't read before, that's some event that had never occurred. Now it has. And look at that. It's part of what I was teaching. Now it's created a new thing for me to think about and learn. The things that make educators blissful, that lead them to creating Educators Eden and staying in Educators Eden, are the exact same things that are going to prevent the success of a great dispute. Anyone can file a great dispute if, if, the, if the administration or the apparatus in your institution permits somebody to file great disputes, and that means that they, under due process, fine, they file a great dispute. It's just like, in my mind, analogous to filing a lawsuit. In the United States, anybody can file a lawsuit at any time. It's a very open system. You know, just go to your courthouse or go online, submit whatever paperwork you have and pay some kind of fee or send some paperwork in and say you don't have the fee, uh, and here's why. And boom, you filed a lawsuit. Now, is that lawsuit going to succeed, meaning is somebody going to win, you know, $50 million against you for a lawsuit? No. The odds of them succeeding are smaller, you know, depending on what the facts were. If you haven't done anything that merits them succeeding in a lawsuit, then you're not – what are you going to worry about if they file one? Let them file it. I mean, you can't stop them from filing it, so why worry about it? And you know you haven't done anything that's incorrect, and you know that you have the, a lot of documentation, here's a lawyer in me, establishing all the things you did do. The, the really neat thing is, all this is, it kind of goes hand in hand. If you really are interested and love what you do, then you're already going to have. You know, if you love music and you teach music, let's say you teach students the jazz music, 
and you love jazz music. Your whole life you've loved jazz music. You've collected, you know, you've got, you know, albums and, and liner notes and books on jazz musicians for fun in your free time. You listen to jazz and go to jazz concerts, and you, you compose jazz music. Uh, you arrange existing um, uh, music, and, and you score um you love jazz. This is what you do when you're on. You're hanging out with your friends. Many times you get together and you just jam. You just go to kind of, you know, each other's places and you get together and you make music together. Or sometimes you'll go to a local place and and play a little jazz. You're just hanging out you're for for fun. You go out with your friends and loved ones and listen to jazz. This is like your thing. Um, so when you're teaching it, you have a whole bunch of information. It's, it's, it forget. Forget not engaging. You're overstimulating your students, right? You know? And when you're talking about it, when you're explaining why, when you're telling this. And actually, now I'm remembering another teacher I had. It was a band teacher, band director, who loved, loved music, right? This is, these are the right people in the right place, whether it's history or music or physics. Or I'm remembering a guy that loved government. You know, just it's your thing. Oh, I'm remembering an English teacher I had. She loved this. And she also wrote in her free time a fictional uh, books. I thought that was the coolest thing when I was in high school. You know, she loves it so much she does it. Right? That's like the jazz teacher who goes and records little, you know, albums in his free time. Or my then English teacher who went and wrote. She wrote books. I could go see one of her books. You know, in a, in a bookstore. To me, that was so cool. That's how much she loves English. Right? That's the right place for them. So this is the person who, when you go in their classes, and this is traditional, you know, I, you know, I was young before the Internet, it's overwhelming with information and enthusiasm. And did you know this and that about this author? And I bet you didn't know this when you read that poem. Or I bet you didn't understand this when you listened to that music. They have so much supplemental material, right, that's so uniquely them. And it's the same thing if they taught online. You know, they're going to have so much stuff in their classes because they're brimming with excitement. So then when they go to grade and give feedback, again, that person's going to give a ton of feedback. You know, here's what you played incorrectly. Here's what I would have changed with that note. Um, if they're looking at your English, you know, here's why I would have used different phrasing or this is why this was, uh, this, this was, you know, not the best it could be and here's what would I have improved. They're so into this that it's like you have to almost rein them back. And that's another, you know, program we've done on, on how much feedback's too much, right? Because people who really love what they do sometimes can get to that point where it's just, it's a little bit, it becomes a little bit overwhelming. You, you just got to dial it down enough for the feedback so the student can digest it without it, you know, the student having to go read like a 100-page, you know, grade report. That's a little, that's a little too much. So, but the, the, the educator who already has all this, you know, that's their thing. They're already enthusiastic and passionate. It's, their, their class is so you know, uniquely exciting in them, you know, their personality and their interests and all the little minutia that they know about this area comes to light, then, and their grading, of course, sometimes it only, their only fear with grading is it's maybe, you know, too much, like making sure you <laughs> distill it down to, to the basics. Um, then if, when people, if someone goes and files a grade dispute, let them. Because anyone that comes to their classes or anyone that looks into their classes, um, anyone that looks at the grading is going to say, wow, right? <laughs> um, you know, this is a lot of grading and feedback. Um, and like I said, what I do when I still have a student who, after all of the feedback I give, says, oh, I don't, you know, I, I'll say to them, okay, we're gonna do we need to have a conference where we sit together and go through your work page by page. And I do that. Uh, you can do it in person if you teach, you know, physically traditional classroom in your office. I do it uh, on the phone. My students are all over the world. Um, and it's great because if I have somebody who comes in indignant, oh, this, I've never had a grade like this. Okay. Um, then let's start working. We start. I literally start with the first word on the first page, and we go, we go item by item, and we talk about all the things that, I'm, that, I, that are noted, that are issues, you know, grammar, logic, content, you know, everything. And let's start doing it. And when we do that, I rarely can go through the whole paper. You know, these are long papers because it takes hours just to talk about, you know, the first couple of pages of, of issues and, to, and direct them to see this is why this was a challenge or incorrect or, you know, inaccurate or this is why this received this part of the grade. And, again, it's just re, it's re-showing that person that, hey, not only did it look like I did the work, I did the work. And this is about them. This is about their their work. This is about who they are. This is about the time and effort they put into their assignment or they didn't put into their assignment in many instances, especially with lower grades. The student will say, you know what, now that I look at this again, I realize I could have put more time into it. I could have edited it. Sometimes like, they even will say, I'm sorry. They don't, it's not they're saying they're sorry to me. They're saying I think they're, they're sorry to themselves, that they didn't have the ability to, to turn in better quality or caliber work. And it, again, shows them whether they, quote, like me or, quote, hate me is irrelevant. It's not about they see that I am working to a level 
to show that I do care. I care about the teaching, and it makes it much harder for them than to feel, well, I'm going to be able to go and just complain. I've had people make all kinds of um, accusations and say all kinds of not nice things, <laughs> but again, I'm in my Eden, so it's not going to ruin this because there's too much. There's too many good things that happen, and there's too many wonderful experiences that a negative, you know, a couple of individual issues over, you know, I've been teaching off and on you know, almost 20 years now. It's not going mean, to, I love this. I always love it. It makes me happy. You know, and if I can share that same happiness and joy for things that are interesting to me and help other students maybe get a shortcut to learning something that they can use and, and make their own lives better, then what a better experience and gift can you have in life? So, the grade disputes are something, again, we don't worry about. Because it's like worrying about, any, you know, the rain. Will it rain? I don't know. If it does, I'll have my umbrella. Um, could somebody sue you in, the, in many parts of the world? Yeah. In the U.S., anybody can go to any courthouse and file any kind of paperwork. That's just the system. You know, nobody checks to make sure at the beginning that, the, that it, what it says. Whether or not they could succeed is very difficult. And with the grade disputes, if you've done all of the things that people who love teaching and have found their, the right place for them do naturally, Right, those people have to worry about too much information sometimes, but there's not going to be any validity for someone to verify a grade dispute and change your grades or do anything like that. Now, if it's an ethical situation, we're not touching places where you know some administration comes to teachers and says, you know, we have too much pressure on us. You better falsify grades. You better change things. I'm not talking about any of those types of things. Those are fraud and criminal behaviors, and we see it in the U.S. again, <laughs> you know, in the in the daily newspaper. There's people from elementary schools to, to high schools to universities doing all kind of horrible, unethical, fraudulent things. But we're not talking about those. Those are examples of things that are illegal. And I'm just talking about a, a functioning legal ethical system where, you know, the educator takes all of that knowledge and passion and enthusiasm and ongoing new knowledge and shares it with the students and helps that student find a way to take that information or those skills to improve their own lives and that's beautiful and an administration hires the best educators and gets out of their way and lets them educate and is appreciative and grateful and and does you know work with them to you know disengage sometimes relax because some people who are so passionate and so excited um will sometimes burn out maybe mentally or physically because they don't have enough balance you gotta you gotta relax Okay, I gotta relax. But other than that, it's a win-win for everybody. It really is. Um, so I am just incredibly appreciative that you took time to join me. For those of you who are in educators, Eden, congratulations and 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 keep doing what you're doing. It's again, I believe one of the highest uh, callings of us as humans is, is knowledge and, and and intellect and learning and uh, teaching. And for those of you who aspire to be, take it, you know, find your space. Remember to tone it down sometimes and, and, and find balance in your life so not everything is jazz, not everything is history, not everything is English because sometimes you don't have enough room to, to be a well-rounded person. Um, and then don't ever worry about any kind of, you know, great dispute because there's only so much we can do. All of us encounter people who just are not making the best choices for themselves. It's stressful to watch, but we can't take on responsibility for that. The individual has to at some point. And then explain, you know, show your work. You've already done that, probably excessively so. <laughs> um, and keep re records of every student interaction and, and document everything, right? And then turn all that over whenever somebody disputes something. And then, you know, if you're working at an ethical, legal place, then all, all they can do is say, look, the person did everything they're supposed to, probably more than they were supposed to, great stands. Um, if there's some other kind of issue, then it's not an ethical or legal place, then that's something that we explore in other programs, and that you definitely then probably need to start finding another place to stay, because it, it, an educator who is super engaged and, 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 and passionate can't function in a place that's not ethical or legal. It, it's just too... Um, damaging to them it's just it's just not the right place for them because they, they do care too much so there we go we're not going to worry about it uh they happen if they never happen to you great if they happen to you every semester or every term fine you know you're doing what you do what you need to continue to look at your professional development and feedback and notes so you can become a better educator we all have a lot of room to improve um use technology to help you uh, supplement what you're doing and make uh, more of your information available to your students. Uh, and then 
continue to be happy and don't worry about the the those it's going to be a minority of people who are going to say you know not nice things to you but don't worry about it but no matter how great you are <laughs> i guarantee you it's still going to happen right that's just life uh and 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 then keep being appreciative of the fact that you have found your place and that you one of those people who's able to wake up and be kind you know excited most days. You know what's going to happen? Mm, I'm kind of excited. I feel good. That's a beautiful quality of life. So again, I always encourage people to come to courtneyanderson.com, share what's on your mind, share your your uh, experiences, let me know if you have any show ideas. And again, thank you for joining me.